83 and part of 84. Wow. That's a long time, man. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting uh, at High Point University this fall. So Good luck. Thank Good you. Good luck. And Anthony, we'll be you're a year behind, right? Yeah, I'm a, I'll be a senior next year. Okay. Yeah, cool. So, do you mind if we go ahead and jump right in? Not at all. All right. No. Listen. So, first, firstly, um, obviously, you're working with the Hurricanes. So, what do you think about the 2014 playoff format? And why do you think the Hurricanes voted against it? Well, I think they voted against it because they didn't they didn't like the fact that you know they were in a playoff spot, and I guess I, the pushback was the play in idea. But, but I don't have a problem with it myself because I first of all, there's two things here. I, I don't think at this time, at this point in history, we need to worry about a playoff format. We're either going to play or we're not. And if the league plays, that's good. And I think hockey fans need it. I think everybody needs a little outlet these days to kind of look at something different like professional sports. And hopefully we get the college sports to kind of revive our emotions and start to feel normal again. I think that would be great. So I could really care less about people's opinions on whether or not the playoff format makes sense. Um, I look at it one way. We're either going to play or we're not. And if we do play, how do you do it? And I do know that the best way to do this was to complete the regular season, bring all the teams back, play the remaining games, situate your playoffs and get on with it. But because of the pandemic and, and, and the delays in quarantines and testing issues and where you're going to play and kind of it being a, a different circumstance all over the world, you know, how could you be uniformed in your decision? So I think they, they went through that and once they ruled the third one doesn't make sense. It didn't make a lot of sense for Detroit and Ottawa and San Jose and some of these teams that were way out of it to come back and play. You know, maybe you go right to the playoffs, but that wasn't fair either because teams like the New York Rangers were pushing hard and really had a remarkable season to get near the wild card spot when they were supposed to be rebuilding and out of the mix, not a great season. And so the Islanders of the Rangers, Columbus, all those teams are around the cut line. In the Atlantic Division, you have Florida and Toronto basically fighting out for third place. And then you have the West, and the West is a little more spread out, but Arizona was the outlier. They're only four points out. That's pretty significant with two weeks to go in the season. But you can't say it was impossible. Right? There's no way to rule them out. And then you get to the Chicago-Montreal aspect. And to be honest with you, I really believe it was a way to enhance the tournament, uh, bring Patrick Kane into the mix, bring Carey Price into the mix, bring two bigger markets into the, into the mix for what looks like a, a glorified TV tournament. So it makes a ton of sense to me. And if we can recapture some revenue and, again, do it safely, to me, it's a positive. I look at things in a positive vein. I don't like to poke holes in something I think that was really complicated. So I'm against the fact that they voted against it, but I'm not there. I'm not a player, and I didn't have an opinion on this. That's that's kind of the way that I've been viewing it as well. At, honestly, like a lot of Hurricanes fans, like myself, are really against the idea that they, you know, they got shafted because they're going to end up having to play New York, and New York was tough for us all year. But at this point, like I'm on the same boat as a lot of other people in that I just want to watch hockey again. Yeah. And, and New York was tough. The Rangers were tough because of the goalies. Lundquist played out of his skull. Uh, Shesterkin played out of his mind and Georgiev. So all three of those guys, you know, if you look at the four games, you could make an argument for the Canes winning at least three of the four games, but the goalies were the X factor and they always are. And that's why hockey is a tremendous sport. So let's stop worrying about it. If you're good enough to beat the Rangers three out of five, God bless you. You move on and you get to the you get to the playoffs, you get to the round of 16 and you go from there. You know, and, and Tampa Bay was the other team that voted against this proposal. And they were worried about, you know, as an upper echelon team, you know, how do they have a competitive edge going against a, a team that's already played a three out of five with emotion and they're kind of cold and there's no crowds involved. You know, I think that was their uh, worry. So now they're going to play a round robin. That's not entirely fair either, depending on how they work the tiebreakers. But again, the world's not fair right now, guys. 
There's nothing in this world that's fair today. You got to make it fair moving forward. And that I think that's what people are trying to do. I can agree with that. <laughs> right? Yep. 100%. Um, so oh, I guess I'll uh, go up next, John. Thank you for coming on again. Um, so my question is in regard, I have a couple of questions, but my first one is in regards to uh, the no fans aspect of, um, you know, the new playoff format. Obviously, that is going to be a huge change to everyone, whether you're, you know, broadcasting or you're, um, you know, watching from home. It's it's going to be a lot different because there's not going to be that energy. And so do you do you think that as a broadcaster, you obviously, you know, have somewhat of an obligation to, you know, um, energize, you know, from from, um, you know, being there and energized for, from the, for the people at home. Like you and Kenny Albert and Doc Emmerich and like Boston Zone, Jack Edwards, like you guys, you know, make the game a lot more, you know, fun. Um, do you guys think you have now, you know, an increased um, you know, obligation to try to give more energy to the game just because, you know, there isn't going to be that fan aspect? Um, I can't give much more energy without sounding like an idiot. So <laughs> I, I hope I, I deliver it anyway. I don't mm. plan on changing much. I want to see if, if when we do this, um, uh, what kind of camera angles and, and what kind of natural sounds might enhance the presentation of the game. You mm -hmm. know, if you want to hear communication on the ice, you want to hear some coaches barking signals, you want to hear what's actually said on the bench, there's going to be somebody with their finger on a button to, to delete a few things along the way, you know, <laughs> clean it up. But I think as fans, we'd enjoy the raw nature of the sport. And I believe as hockey's played, even in an environment like this with no fans, just the nature of the game is going to make it really intense because it's a physical game. And mm. so if you're pushing back at, at another team and, and they push back hard at you, it's a natural human reaction to get, you know, ticked off and to play mm. harder and to do all those things. So I think the game will take care of itself. I don't think it'll be as generic as, say, baseball, if they play, will be without fans. I think we'll be okay. Do they pipe in some uh, background noise? I think we'll have music. Uh, I'm not 100% sure we're going to we're going to pipe in crowd noise if they do. I've seen that over in Germany with their professional soccer leagues. Maybe that works. Uh, but all you know, all bets are off under these circumstances. You try something and you see where it goes. The good news is everyone's so starved to see it. I think we're going to love it when we see it. And then the drama of the, the entire tournament will take place. And then once the first games are out of the way, we're going to have a story on our hands. Mm. Now, I, can, I can kind of speak on that because, um, John, I live in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. So I've been involved with the, um, the ACCHL hockey tournament. And I've gotten a chance to call a couple of those games. And there is, I can't say that there's a sport that would have fewer fans than George Washington and West Virginia club hockey in North Carolina <laughs> at 9.30 on a, on a Saturday night. So <laughs> having the natural sound in an empty arena like that is, it's better to me than having that crowd energy, in my opinion. But yeah, and those, and those players, Graham, those players play hard, don't they? They play they, hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, because they're not there because they're getting paid. They're there because they love the game. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of going to butt in here. Uh, I know I mentioned before I'm not the biggest hockey guy, but I'm a sports fan. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a sports right. fan. I can appreciate the toughness and intensity of hockey, even though I believe that wrestling is tougher because I've been there through that. Um, <laughs> I, I just wanted to ask you, what's the – um. Can you just paint the picture for me of um, the best game you've ever called, just the intensity, and just paint that picture for me? Well, I'll agree with you on wrestling, first of all. Thank you. Because <laughs> Thank you. Um, I never wrestled in my life, right? And I was a phys ed major as an undergrad at Springfield College in Massachusetts, and I had to take a wrestling skills class. You know, you take all these skills classes in mm -hmm. various sports, you can teach them someday, gymnastics and so on. Yeah. And the wrestling coach popped my neck. I was a demo, the first class as a freshman, skinny kid. <laughs> popped my neck, and I was in a soft brace for like two weeks. So oh. I have a 100% appreciation for real wrestling. There's, there's no question mm -hmm. about it. And uh, Jeff Blatnick, do you ever hear that name? Have not. Wrestling? Gold medalist from, from our school, I believe, in the 84 Olympics. 
gold medalist, wow. Greco Roman. Anyway, uh, off track here. Greatest game I've ever done. It's a very good question. I get it a lot. Um, and, and the answer is kind of trite, okay? Because um, I've, I've done so many games under various circumstances local games, national games, uh, all the games involving the Canes, national playoff games involving other teams. Uh, the one game I did that I think is unique and 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 way different, and this is what this is the type of circumstance I'll give you too, is the outdoor game I did between Toronto and Detroit in 2017, centennial game in Toronto, New Year's Day. Um, remarkable experience. It's the only outdoor game I've seen in person. I did the call with Pierre Maguire and Brian Boucher and uh, Jeremy Roenick, Catherine Tappan. It was a sensational experience. Um, and then I would say this season. Although the Canes playoff games are all great and certainly being part of the game seven and 06 where they won the Stanley Cup on radio was remarkable for me. But I would say this David Ayers game where we had the emergency backup goalie come in <laughs> in February. That was so unique and so historic and uh, such a great story, not only for hockey, but even you who's not very familiar with hockey can appreciate a guy coming out of the crowd, an everyday guy and jumping into a major league sport and winning the game like that's a Hollywood script. So for mm -hmm. me, broadcasting that game was was sensational. Mm. Yeah. That was that was kind of one of the answers that I had, you know, prepared to hear from you. The other one that I'm you know where i'm kind of interested off script but where is this where does the game seven against washington from last season where does that rank for you it's right there and and, and the entire and, and even game three of mm -hmm. round one last year because it was the first playoff game since 09 right right so, Raleigh. Man, that was that was sensational because uh playoff hockey returned to raleigh and return to the Carolinas, and, and and here we go again. And and we didn't know what to expect. It just went to the same level, even better than it was when they won the cup, in my opinion, in 06. And then game seven in Washington, double overtime, uh, sensational, sensational game. And those games that you do locally are, are special because you're just broadcasting to your Hurricanes audience and those that want to see your feed now on NHL center ice and all of that. So it's way different from the dark ages when I started. <laughs> right. Um, Anthony, you, you gonna go with your other one? Oh yeah, I got another one lined up. Um, recently, I've been writing a bunch of blogs about um who the greatest this is, who the greatest that is. I call it goat talk. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna continue with that trend with you. Um, I want to know who the greatest player is that you've ever gotten to um watch in your storied career. Well, the greatest player for me is Bobby Orr. Okay, mm -hmm. but I was a kid. <laughs> but I still think I still think Bobby Orr revolutionized the game. Uh, was an unbelievable uh, dominant player. You look at his numbers. You look at you know MVPs and Norris trophies and all that. In a ten year career that was cut short because of a knee injury. But the greatest player I ever covered was Wayne Gretzky, without question. And one of the greatest individuals I've ever met is is Wayne Gretzky as a as a normal human being. Um, Sidney Crosby's along the same line. He he's a really good guy. Like uh, he'll sit there and give us the time of day and respect media and, and work with us. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean just because, you know, they give us a little bit of love. I have any bias, but I think you look at how he's helped grown the game. Uh, Ovechkin has, has grown the game in this generation. No question. Connor McDavid's going to do it moving forward and others, Patrick Kane, you know, you can start going through this long list. But to come up with the GOAT, the GOAT, the, the, what you're looking at here, um, in, in my years of doing this, 30-plus years of broadcasting the NHL, Wayne Gretzky, without question. Yeah. Yeah. And I was going to kind of go off um, on asking you who your favorite player is that you've gotten to watch. And you said that Wayne Gretzky was just an outstanding human being. Would you say he falls under that category as well? Yeah, and there's a long line of that. You hear that a lot. You hear, oh, hockey players are really – great guys. Uh, by and large, they are. Uh, I think most professional athletes really are. I mean, you, you're, you have this unbelievable God-given ability. You work extremely hard to manufacture it, make it better as you go through your journey. And, and most of them, the a high percentage of players in all sports that reach the highest level of their, their craft, give back and, and are, are decent people because they, they, they don't forget. They don't forget where they, they have come from. So, 
it, my only experience, you know, outside of some brushes with college basketball, a little bit of football early in my career, but as a broadcaster, I've been just in the National Hockey League and before that, the American Hockey League. And um, there's tremendous people I've been lucky enough to come across and they're still friends. And, you know, Gretz is right there. Mario Lemieux, great person. I mean, you go down the list here of uh, all the great hockey players that have come down the pike and, and Bobby Orr's in that class. And, and I never knew him when he played, but I've gotten to know him because he is um, an agent now and has been for a long time. And at one point in my career helped me get a job in Hartford. He actually uh, helped me in an indirect way get my first shot at this in 1991 with the Hartford Whalers. <laughs> Hail to the whale, baby. <laughs> um, so I, I want to jump back right to the playoff format again. And I wanted to ask you, so obviously this, this playoff format lets teams that were right outside the playoffs. And sometimes, you know, some teams that didn't really have a shot, you know, like Montreal is one of them that, you know, wasn't probably going to make the playoffs, but, you know, right. they get a chance here. Um, is there a team, you know, both in the East and the West, obviously, you know, the Hurricanes uh, surprised everyone last year to beat the Capitals and push it to the, you know, conference finals. Um, is there a team in the East and the West that, you know, you feel that if, if they get hot, you know, watch out, you know, for me, I'd probably go with Pittsburgh just because I don't, they're a team that I feel like, you know, could easily be a top four seed in the East and they have, they, you know, they're going in the playing round, but I feel like, you know, if they catch fire, you know, they can go beat Washington, they can beat Philly. Is there a team, you know, in the East and the West that you feel, you know, that, you know, a couple of games can, you know, turn their season around theoretically? Well, when we stop playing is far different, you know, from March 12th to here on mm -hmm. June 5th. Yep. And by the end of July, it's going to be even different because of the health of all these teams. You know, you look at Pittsburgh and how they've survived injuries and now they should be healthy. You look at the Canes and, you know, Dougie Hamilton and Sammy Votnin, who hasn't even played a game yet for the Hurricanes, right. will be you know, available on defense. So to answer that question, it's almost impossible to gauge where everybody's going to be at. And the other thing I'd point out is um, goalies. You know, how do you know after four mm -hmm. months where these goalies are going to be at. And you might think Carey Price can carry Montreal. You might think Tuka Rask can do w what he did all season for Boston. If you were to ask me on March 12th, I'd tell you about the Boston Bruins are going to win the Stanley Cup. But I can't tell you that today. I don't and and we will go to that's why the <laughs> tournament, that, well, just to pick a team out. Yeah. You know, but. The, but the, that's why the tournament will be so interesting after the first games are played, because then we'll know what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And maybe maybe the Hurricanes, who I think have – I'm looking at youth, I'm looking at health, and, and how well they're coached. I think those are the only three factors you can look at. You don't know what kind of rhythm they're going to be in. You don't know what kind of shape they're going to be in. And you can't say how a goalie is going to be after not seeing a puck for four months, maybe a two week training camp. And here we go. Even in the lockouts, even in the lockouts, and we've had three of them guys, um, the players were able to play somewhere and they were able to practice a lot better than this. This is coming in cold. So, you know, the Canes could take off and win the cup. Sure. But mm -hmm. on March 12th, I think Boston is making a strong case along with St. Louis and others because we have such great parity in the NHL. But um, I don't know anybody handicaps the uh, National Hockey League when it returns. I think it's almost impossible. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and that was something similar. I, um, I had a phone call with Doc Emmerich uh, the other day, and I was um, asking him a similar question. He said kind of the same thing. But one thing that um, he mentioned that he thought was interesting was that he thought that all things considered, all of the – Pause aside, he thought that Edmonton and Chicago would be uh, one of the series to watch just based on the pure star power that those two teams have. So who do you think, like which of the play-in mashups do you think would fall into that category for you as one to keep an eye on? Well, it's it's close to my heart here, but I think Carolina and the Rangers is going to be a remarkable series to watch. I think that's going to be fast. I think you're going to see, you talk about, you know, that series with Patrick Kane and Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl, Jonathan Taves, you know, you go down the list here, but then there's a drop off for me with Chicago and Edmonton. When you get to the back end, when you look at both team defenses and when you look at the goalies, 
Okay. I don't think when you look at the Rangers Carolina matchup, man for man, goal out, whew, that that's that's a good one. Like that that one there is uh you got Carolina with the argu- arguably the most deep defensive core in the league. Um, the goalies can get hot. Maraza can get really hot. He can also be cold. But you have the Rangers who have kind of built with depth at goal, a very good m- mobile defense now, young, and then Panarin and Zabanajad, the seasons they were having, and, and both coaches I highly respect, David Quinn and Rod Brindamore. To me, that matchup uh, will be one to watch. That will be a lot of fun. Especially if they return the SAT line and – you know, the things that yeah. that line did at points in the season was just ridiculous. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So you, you you start to break it down player for player, and it really starts to get you excited. And, and I think that's what that series will deliver. Other series, I mean, Florida, Toronto, Columbus, and the Islanders, um, you know, the other out in the West – you know, I'm I'm not a hundred. They they don't do it for me. I think Doc is uh, right on with the Edmonton Chicago, and I think that was part of the lure to get the Blackhawks involved in this mm-hmm. was to create something like this. This is almost like a reality show. They've created this thing, um, but the Rangers in in Carolina is a is a heated matchup in the making. Yeah. John, I have one last question for you. Um, so there's I don't know if it's official yet. Um, Maybe you can answer that for me, but there's been the reports about whether they're going to do keep the bracket style or they're going to reseed after every after, after every round. Um, right. As a Boston fan, I'm personally in favor of the reseeding, obviously for a number of reasons. But you know, in the past we've gotten kind of screwed over having to face Toronto and Tampa, you know, right. a couple of years ago, and then obviously we got lucky with Columbus. But generally, we have you know a one-two punch every single year. Um, are you in favor of? keeping the bracket style um, or do you think reseeding is just the way to go? Yeah. Re- reseeding for me. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's what it will be. As a matter of fact, they, they, they announced something along those lines last night. Yeah. And I think that's what the players wanted. Um, the commissioner loves brackets. Okay. <laughs> yeah. he, he, you know, he, he, he believes and there's something to it that the bracket theory obviously works in March madness. But that's something that's totally different. But he feels in fan interest, you can create a bracket, you can follow it, you can you can fill it out, and you can have your own fantasy leagues with bracketology, and you know that's what he's trying to drive at. I don't like it myself. I like reseeding. I think there has to be rewards for top teams. We have the best regular season, I think, of all the sports, where basically almost every team's in it right to the end. So why not make it so the teams that are at the top and have fought that hard have a little bit of a, a break, uh, even though I don't think it's much of one, but it gives them a little bit of a break that they've played for to play a lower C. I don't like these second round Titanic matchups that you might want to see in the Stanley Cup final. I don't, I don't like that at all. So they will recede. They will go three out of five in the play in. They will go four out of seven in every other round of the round of 60. Yeah, that's for sure. Awesome. Yeah, I, th- I think that's the way to go as well. And that kind of leads into the next question and final question I had for you, which is, you know, where does the NHL go from here? Obviously, they've got the proposed playoff format. They've got mm-hmm. the hub cities narrowed down a little bit. But what does it look like from, uh, you know, a logistics standpoint for the league as a whole from this point and then going into next year as well? Um, so what do you think that, you know, the league is faced with at this point? Well, it's a great question, and the last part of your question is the most important part. What what bridge does this bring us to for the next season? So I'll touch on that when I'm done. Um, they just announced officially that Phase 2 is underway starting Monday. So as of Monday now, finally, teams can come back on a voluntary basis to their training centers and train in small groups of six without coaches and go through the protocol, the testing, the masks, having an infectious disease doctor on call with each team just in case you have an outbreak or whatever. And that will go on for what looks like at least three weeks and maybe longer. Um, I've heard for training camps, full-on training camps in the markets July 14th, which would lead us to think that they would have at least a 10-day training camp, probably two weeks. I don't think it'll be three weeks. 
And I've always felt that in and around July 24 to the 31st, uh, the, the, I know NBC wanted that as a, a window of opportunity because they lost the Olympics and the Olympics were supposed to start on July 24th. So I've always felt that's when the tournament will start and how it affects moving forward. You know, it, it's affecting everything in hockey. The next entry draft, they figured out the draft lottery. Um, you know, when we draft the, the next group of players, when trades are consummated, all that off-season stuff, free agency we normally see on July 1, what's the date for that, and then how you get to the next season and when does it start. There has been speculation that the next season will start July 1st with the Winter Classic. I've heard that the NBA is looking at Christmas Day as their official kickoff for the next season. Well, guys, obviously, if you do that and play 82 games, we're talking about a summertime playoff again next year. And if we get into July and the beginning of August of the next season, we finally give the Stanley Cup away in 2021, what happens the next season? You don't mm -hmm. just come back and do it again in October. I think it won't be as drastic as January, but I think the NHL will adjust the regular seasons moving forward, as will the NBA, to get away from the football cloud to get away from the direct competition with NCAA and NFL football and let it play out for a couple of months and let those teams in the NFL play their way out of the mix. Let the colleges that are all hepped up in late August and September and October, you know, realize, oh, we're 500. We might be going to a minor bowl. We might not be going to any bowl. We're done, you know, and then bring the NBA and the NHL into the fans view and maybe more eyes because I think in October, we fight it. We fight crowds and we fight ratings. It's hard to get people excited about the National Hockey League unless they're really diehard hockey fans. It just isn't going to work. So we could see a change in that. And I think this all has something to do with it. So it'll be interesting to watch. And then, of course, I think the January start and the Christmas Day start lead us hopefully to a place where we have fans because we have to have fans in the next season. There will be none of this no fans in arenas. I don't think they want to do that at all. So there will be partial crowds or there will be full on crowds. And hopefully the pandemic's behind us. We have some kind of vaccine or close. We're in a better place. Everybody feels safer and we can get on with life again. But uh, that at least is the plan. And I think it's pretty realistic that they will be pushing everything back. Mm. And I think, I think that would be great for the league as well to have more of the summertime playoff, you know, yeah. atmosphere because playoff hockey is already one of the greatest atmospheres in all the sports and then you throw it in in the late june early july yeah. part of the year when there's nothing but mid-season baseball and you wouldn't be competing with anything other than potentially the nba playoffs right and they'll play themselves out and we usually play at that stage when we get to the later rounds the third and fourth rounds certainly in the fourth round we're going on alternate days so you never have an NHL Stanley Cup final game against an NBA finals game. It just doesn't happen. So you could work the schedule out that way. And then I put both sports, but certainly hockey for sure, head to head with Major League Baseball regular season. I mean, mm -hmm. OK, you want to sit there for three hours or and I love baseball. But I think that especially your generation uh, sit there for nine innings and watch it. Um, you know, it's 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 not as easy as we did, you know, back in the dark ages when we didn't have much else to do. But you put a hockey game against it and just the nature with air in that sport, ice is not an issue anymore. You can make ice no matter what the conditions are. So the building will be really cold and comfortable and uh, be a great alternative. And I think the commissioner realizes that he sees that as a window in the summer to really get, uh, even enhance the ratings that are already pretty good in the Stanley Cup playoffs. I think you hit the nail on the head. And um, I really appreciate you coming on with us. I can't Thank speak you. for everybody else, but it's been, you've been a great guest. Uh, and, I hope uh, so. Yeah. So I, I just, I can't thank you enough. Like I said, it's been, you know, kind of a dream of mine to be able to talk with you at some point as a Hurricanes fan. So this has been awesome for me. Mm. Well, Graham, I hope your life improves moving forward. <laughs> Thank you. I really do. But I do appreciate what you said. And uh, and guys, just hang in there. Huh? Tough world today, but uh, uh, you guys will make it better. I, I, I believe that. I believe that. So uh, do something with it, okay? Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you, you so much. On. Thank you. Yes. Boys, take care. Yeah, you too, John.